I'd like very much to sh ask you to share your experiences, your knowledge, and compare that against what I'll be presenting today. What I'll be presenting today is what the research literature has told us about risk and crisis communication, communi communicating under fire, nearly three decades of research, focused on how to communicate effectively about high concern issues, high stress issues, issues involving controversy. And certainly the whole issue of bioterrorism fits well into that category. I'd like to encourage you that if you'd like to share anything as I go through my material, that if you'd like to share your own experiences, you feel free to do so. The advantage, as I mentioned, are threefold. One is that we can hear your experiences and we can test it against what the research literature has had to offer for nearly three decades. Uh, this lit literature now is very large. There's nearly 8,000 articles and 4,000 books dealing with this topic alone. The second reason is, is that because of the time, we have an hour, I'm going to be offering today a reduced version of a 14-week course I offer on this topic. Um, I hope to cover all 14 weeks of material in one hour, which means you'll notice as I get closer and closer to uh, uh, the end of the hour, I'll be speaking faster and faster. Um, I come from New York City. That gives us an advantage over most Americans. We speak about three times faster than most Americans, sometimes as fast as th six to nine words per second compared to the American average of three words per second. But I'm getting too fast. I'm going to ask you to slow me down so that we can spend time discussing as opposed to simply listening. Um, the third advantage that I'd like to suggest that we can take advantage of the opportunity for dialogue has to do with the fact that um, often there's a reluctance on the part of individuals to offer their observations in a group setting. And by my encouraging you to do so, I'm hoping that that might be an incentive for you to ask a question to make an observation. Um, I'll give you an illustration of what I mean by this. Um, nearly 75 years ago, there was a person called Dale Carnegie. How many have heard of Dale Carnegie? Um, I have to ask these questions. Recently, I asked my niece if she knew who someone, what I thought was famous, was Dr. Uh, Marcus Welby. And she looked at me rather quizzically, saying, who are you talking about? Um, uh, Dale Carnegie, uh, he made an observation that relates to my topic today. Um, I, I, I focus and specialize in communicating in times of stress, fear, when people are upset, angry, uh, anxious, worried. And he made an observation, and I, I thought it was self-serving at the time because he asked people what they feared most in life, what they feared most in life. Sometimes they asked this as an open-ended question, sometimes as a closed end where he gave people choices such as, do you fear most in life, death, disease, poverty? And he reported that the most common, frequent response he received back to his question was that what people feared most in life were not those three sort of horsemen, but the, there was a fourth, and one that was greater than the others. And that was what? Does anybody remember what that was? Fear of public speaking. Um, when I heard that, I said, That's, uh, this is self-serving. Uh, he, he sells books on public speaking. He gives courses on public speaking. And obviously, his observation was simply trying to sell more books or maybe to encourage people to come to his classes. So about 25 years ago, we actually did research on that very topic. Uh, we took it as, not as a statement of fact, but as a hypothesis, which all science, good science does. In fact, I hope this is a value added of my presentation today. Everything I share with you is based on research that's been published in the peer-reviewed scientific literature about how to communicate under fire, under conditions of high stress, high concern. We replicated his research, which was done very loosely in a more systematic way, and the observation we came up with is now be, is referred to as the 15% rule. The 15% rule. And that is that in any group, you're, you're unlikely to hear from more than 15% of the audience. This is regardless of um, socioeconomic class, occupation, education. It doesn't matter. That when you put individuals together in a classroom or any group setting, you're unlikely to hear from more than 15%. Unfortunately, even within the 15%, there'll often be biases that are associated with those 15% that decide to share their views. Um, I consider this research result to be a, a very severe criticism of a very common technique used by public health for the purposes of communicating in high-stress situations, and that is the town meeting, the public meeting. It's a common device we use when we have information to share we call the town meeting. And yet, if you call a town meeting, that research result suggests that you're going to hear at that town meeting, first of all, it won't be the town. It won't be part of the town, unless you happen to be in New England. And only a small percentage of the town will actually be there. And only a small percentage of those that are there will actually ask a question or express themselves. 
for what reason? What's, what's going on here? What, what is causing a person to be reluctant? Why is it that you're li unlikely to ever hear? In fact, I've actually tested this at the university where we have the best teachers at the university sharing information, counting the number of, the time of, of students who ask questions or make observations. Even when, when they are fighting to get in the class, it's less than 15%, the 15% rule. You might want to suggest what's going on here? What, 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 what's hindering a person? Why does a person have to encourage individuals to raise their hand to speak up in a group setting? What's going on? Yeah. It's a risk, right. So it, we're adding a risk to a risk now. The risk is the risk of what? What, what might happen? What, what is the risk? Uh, we talk in public health about risk of loss of our health status, risk of death, disease. Uh, so what, what is the risk that we're facing when we speak up in public? OK, the risk of appearing foolish. The risk of appearing foolish is the answer. In fact, the risk of appearing foolish is part of a larger category of the risk of being embarrassed in public. It's one of the fundamental values of all human beings in all places. We all wish to avoid embarrassment in our interactions with others. It's a good principle to remember in life that you don't want to ever put a per person, especially a person in high stress, in a situation of having to be embarrassed. And that's one of the prime motivations. There's other motivations why a person won't speak up in public. For example, fear of reprisal, loss of anonymity, putting themselves in conflict with others. You see a slide, a very important slide in the history of risk and crisis communication. It was a speech given by Ed Baker in December 2001. It was his summary of the, the experience of the public health community since 9-11. And in that summary, he points out that the major challenges to the public health system from 9-11 to December were not just the technical challenges, epidemiological laboratory analysis, but communication. And then he goes on to say that as we move into the 21st century, communication may well become the central science of public health practice. In order to encourage discussion, uh, whoever's sitting next to you, first of all, can you just introduce yourself? To whoever's in that sitting next to you, make a friend. Uh, make a friend. Introduce yourself to someone. Okay? Good. And this is what I'd like you to do um, with your new friend. Uh, Look at this quote and tell me if there are any words that are surprising to you. Any words, any concepts that you think might be surprising to someone um, in the public health community. This was given as a satellite broadcast, um, presumably seen by every public health uh, worker in the United States. And tell me if there are any words that you might find particularly surprising that might be upsetting, if not just simply jarring, to those in the public health community. Just discuss this among yourself for a second while I... Any response to that? Any, any, any words that anyone um, finds rather surprising there? Anything that you think might? Central science. How many picked up on that notion of central science? Uh, first, just is the notion of science. We typically don't think of communication as a science. We think of communication as an art, a skill, but hardly a science. And then it augments that with the notion of a central science which means that something that perhaps wasn't even considered as part of the galaxy or the solar system of science now becomes the central science around which all other sciences revolve. Um, I'd like to make the proposition and, and work through this proposition in my presentation today that each and every public health worker has a responsibility as part of our public health practice to be familiar with the basic concepts of the field called risk and crisis communication from a scientific perspective. To be familiar with the ideas, concepts that have come down to us from nearly three decades of research that had its origins nearly 2,000 years ago in ancient Greece with Aristotle and others. When I talk about communication as a science, there are three basic categories of research. The first deals with a science of message development. What are the characteristics, is, characteristics of the most effective messages in a high-stress, high-concern situation? There's a second science that deals with the characteristics of the most effective messengers, those who would deliver the message to us. And there's a third science that deals with the selection, the choice, the implementation of the most effective means by which to deliver those messages. Uh, the purpose of the of, of this science is, I would argue, the opposite of uh, what I mentioned before, that we usually don't think of communication as a science. We think of it as most as a skill in art. Sometimes people think of communication negatively. For example, in terms of propaganda, public relations, 
spin. Making things appear to be that which they're not. I'll make the argument, and this is the list of the central goals of risk and crisis communication, that our goals are very noble. Consistent with Ned Baker's commitment to education, the first goal of all communication is always knowledge, understanding, education. We also hope that through that education we build trust. We hope that when there's disagreements that we can engage in constructive dialogue. And I would argue most importantly, we hope from the communication comes the ability to make a wise decision in an imperfect world with imperfect information. With that in mind, we can also think about this from the negative perspective, as opposed to those positive goals. How many have ever had a communication regret in your life, something you wish you had not said, or something you wish you had said? I'll argue also that the purpose of using the science of risk and, risk and crisis communication and applying it to our public health practice reduces the probability of regret reduces the probability that we'd have to have to say to ourselves or others, I'm sorry I said that. Or coming back and saying, I'm sorry I didn't say this. I had the opportunity. I shared with you a second ago one of the elements of that research. I just want to give you a couple of examples before I become more formal in, in the presentation. I offered up the 15% rule. The 15% rule should guide any public health practitioner recognizing that if you bring a group together, you're going to hear from less than 15%. That's a serious detriment to the democratic process. It's going to affect dialogue, our ability to engage with conversation, because we're not going to engage with any more than 15%. And the reason for that goes back to these three research results as well. These are basic human values. I mentioned before they were hold and bind us together as part of the human race. We universally want to avoid embarrassment. It means that anything we do in public health practice, for example, respecting the privacy of a patient, making sure we don't embarrass people in public. My parents had a, a, a dictum with their, their, the children, praise in public, punish in private. And I would argue you can extend those types of principles away from the home to the public health practice, making sure that what we do does not people put people who want to speak up to engage in dialogue in an embarrassing situation. And that would argue also for reducing the number of times that we use the town hall public meeting as a way by which to engage. This is one of the principles, if you're going to become critical of any device, in this case a means of communication, then you have to offer up alternatives. For example, the risk communication literature contained as one of the principal alternatives to the town meeting, bringing people together for the purposes of engaging in dialogue about a sensitive public health issue such as bioterrorism. And instead using the open, open house, the information forum, as a way by which to proceed. It's just a, a very quick exercise, just to get you th thinking through it. What are the advantages? The, this is the kiosk system, the poster station. It was used, for example, in New York City as one of the ways by which to engage individuals following 9-11. It's been used extensively throughout the United States for a wide range of issues. The notion behind the kiosks is that each kiosk should represent an individual concern identified in the community. This is particularly important given the focus on local public health. That each community will be unique in terms of the concerns, issues, needs, information needs that they have. Just take a second and see if you can identify three advantages to this over the town meeting. I've already given you one, for example that it helps to deal with one of those fundamental values, the, the value of not wanting to embarrass yourself. Why? Because now we can reduce the size of the audience. Instead of having a large audience, we can have a small audience. We can engage with people on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Whoever's sitting next to you, again, as a second exercise, um, what other advantages flow from this technology as a way by which to engage a community about any sensitive public health issue as opposed to the town meeting? And it's not necessarily an either-or situation. You can hold, for example, an information before, before a town meeting. You can keep it open while the town meeting goes on, and you can, for example, keep it open after the town meeting is finished. But what advantages from a communication perspective would flow from using this as, the, as opposed to the traditional town meeting? Just to take a second and discuss this with your neighbor. See what you come up with.
Okay, let's see what we came up with. Uh, I, again, I, I'm trying to make this into a seminar, really, because I believe that it's really in the dialogue process that real learning takes place, the Socratic method, the questioning method, as opposed to the lecture didactic method. Um, what advantages? Uh, I'd, I'd like you to try to see what, what the research community sees in using devices such as this as opposed to the traditional town meeting where we bring large numbers of people together for the purposes of sharing information. How many are familiar with what I'm referring to? The table up in front on a raised dais with the experts talking to a community in rows and rows of what's called classroom style seating. And the alternative is, is a series of kiosks or poster stations that have an individual. A table top in front where you can have handout materials, technical reports. We have posters that are organized according to the principles of message display. And I'll talk in a second about the principles of message display, particularly the principle of the rule of three. But simply talking about this as a means by which to deliver information that is critical for people to make informed decisions, to build trust, to share knowledge and education. What advantages flow from this? Any, any comments? Please. Good. So the issue, and again, I'll repeat, uh, if it's not a priority for someone, that you don't have to wade through a public meeting in order to get that concern addressed. In fact, a research project we did just last year indicates that when people are invited to an open house or an information forum before a town meeting, that as many as 85% of people go home before the town meeting. Even though they expected, anticipated staying for the town meeting, they went home anyway. Why? because they got the answer to the question. They didn't have to listen to other questions and other answers that have nothing to do with their concerns. You're able now to adapt to the individual, to their knowledge, listen closely to what their message is so that you can respond well, as opposed to trying to do it in a group setting where it becomes sequential and linear. Um, I mentioned there's some other uh, universal values that drive human interaction. Um, these are three that came from a, a recent United Nations conference on universal human values that I participated in. The first was the universal desire to avoid embarrassment. And again, we can think about all the applications in our personal lives as well as our professional lives where this becomes a rule of the road. The second is to win and not lose. Much of what's involved in, in, in modern public health is negotiation. And for those familiar, for example, with the MIT Harvard Negotiation Project, one of the most sophisticated research projects on negotiation ever attempted, nearly 20 years of research leading to books such as Getting to Yes, that you can recognize the value, for example, of and applying this principle that people want to win and not lose. I don't care if you're a winner as long as I don't feel like I'm a loser. The purpose of the MIT Harvard program, uh, Roger Fisher and others, is to accomplish through sophisticated communication win-win solutions to situations that otherwise may result in a win-lose or a zero game. The third is a sense of control. That universally people desire to be in control of their lives and their destiny. What does that mean? Um, again, I, 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 I could share with you things at the very broad level, but I'm always looking for the practical application of a research result. This is a very high level of abstraction. And of course, it means different things in different countries and different places. There's a diversity issue. For example, what's winning in one country is not necessarily winning in another country. Um, I watched the uh, World uh, Skating Championships recently, and it was fascinating to me to watch the skating champions that won the silver medal. The American sports announcer went to the winners of the silver medal, a Canadian couple and said, congratulations on winning the silver medal in skating in the World Championships. But it says, how does it feel being a loser? Um, this implies that for that particular individual, that winning is what? Being number one, gold medal. Anything other than the gold medal is what? A loser. Uh, I was fascinated to watch the response by the skater. It was a perfect, what is referred to in the professional literature as a 2793, which is 27 words in nine seconds with three messages. It defines what the modern risk and crisis communication literature quantitatively defines a soundbite to be. 
typically the media will give you in the year 2003 27 words and nine seconds by which to express a message. She had three points she made. First, she said, we feel like we're winners. We feel winners because we had a chance to compete in the world championship with the best skaters in the world. We feel like we're winners because we had the opportunity to be together with those other great skaters. But most of all, we feel like we're winners because we won a silver medal for ourselves and for our country. 27 words, 9 seconds. Let's take the third one, sense of control. Again, what, what one person's sense of control is not necessarily another person's sense of control. We certainly in public health are always looking for ways that we can maintain control, for example, control a public health issue. But it means that part of our responsibility in public health is also to give people a sense of control, things that they can do themselves to control their own destinies. With that in mind, each team, again, uh, another, another exercise. Think through what are some of the practical implications. If this is true, that people universally, including at the local level, desire a sense of control, what does that mean for public health practice from a communication perspective? How do we implement that principle in practice itself? Take a second. Just talk to your neighbor. See if you come up with anything at all. I'm working very quickly because we have a short time. And any observations here? What, what would be, if, if we're using sense of control as a guiding principle by which to implement a, a, our communication, to find a practical way to implement in our communications, what does it mean? What do we do? Please. By the way, I, I'm a little hard for me to see because there's a blinding light here in front of me, so it's, I, I apologize that if it's, I'm slow to recognize. Hi. Okay, good. So one of the ways that we, we help people is that we can communicate our preparedness. That would give both ourselves a sense of control over the situation. We're prepared for a disaster. It would also give, for example, the community a sense of control that the community is prepared for a disaster. I'll argue the importance of the point you just made relates to uh, one of the next uh, bullets on the next slide. It's very clear from the analysis of nearly 8,000 case studies of risk and crisis communication in public health over the last 25 years that it's virtually impossible, especially at the local level, to respond well in a crisis without preparation. Very seldom will you act in an, a non-regretful way. Very seldom will you ever communicate in a non-regretful way without anticipation and preparation. But what does it mean to be prepared? One is, for example, to have a plan, a communication plan. But I'll, I'll push this a little further. Uh, if we start, for example, with the last bullet and work our way, way up, uh, the anticipation, I list there something called the 95% rule. What the 95% rule is, is that nearly three decades of research indicates that for any public health controversy and for any stakeholder, 95% of the questions that that stakeholder will ask in a crisis situation can be predicted in advance. 95% of all questions that any stakeholder will ask in any public health controversy or conflict can be predicted in advance. If you're interested in these types of questions, if you go on, the, for example, the Association of State and Territorial Health Officers website, you'll find, for example, a list of questions that journalists ask in a disaster. There are 77 such questions based on analysis of, of um, press conferences over 25 years. How many believe it's a pattern in the questions that reporters ask? Patterns. Especially in a disaster. Like what? Such as what? What would they be asking? Just as a, make believe we're at a press conference today. And we would get, for example, a disaster would occur. For example, we find a mystery illness within the community. SARS. Or we find, for example, and we'd hope this would never happen, a case of a, uh, a possible terrorist um, release of a biological agent. I'd like everyone in the room just to make believe for a second that you're a reporter. 
I'm the public health spokesperson. I might be the public health, local public health information officer. And of course, the first part of preparedness as part of your plan is to make sure you know who's in charge. Who's going to take the questions? Who's going to provide the responses? What is, in fact, your plan in case of an emergency? But as part of your emergency preparedness, I would argue that the bullet, the 95% rule becomes critical because if you're trying to work out your answers at the time of the press conference, you're likely to have a lot of regrets. You're also unlikely to achieve the goals of knowledge, education, trust building, dialogue, let alone helping people to make informed decisions, such as what action should I take next to protect myself and my families, and my family. Let's make the leap for the time being that we're at a press conference. All right, um, I'd like every person to raise, I'm not going to answer any of these questions, uh, by the way. I'm not going to answer them, because that's part also of the communication process. In fact, that would bring us up to number one, that for each and every question that you can anticipate, you should have prepared a 2793. It comes from the, lit the research literature on attention spans, that in a high-stress, high-concern situation, an individual seldom can process more than three points, can seldom process more than 27 words, and can seldom process more than nine seconds of material. Which means that after we've anticipated the questions as part of our preparedness, we would also prepare our 2793s, just as that Canadian skater had done, had done a second ago that I mentioned. With that in mind, Make believe we're at a, uh, okay, and yes, sir. And I'll repeat the questions again just uh, as a way by which to, please. Okay, is it true that the governor is going to activate the National Guard and quarantine Bowling Green? By the way, we're going to continue this only after every person has their hand up. You have to ask me a question. No, I'm not going to take any questions until every single hand goes up. You're all reporters, you all want a Pulitzer Prize. You all want, for example, that, great, good, okay, now we're getting some response in it. You're, you're all just desperate to get your, because this is going to be a, a live press conference and you'll be on TV too. You'll be a celebrity. Please. But we don't raise your hand unless you have a question. Okay. <laughs> uh, the, uh, okay, how does it spread, for example? How does this mystery illness spread? How does smallpox spread? Another question. Okay. Okay, give me an explanation of how this happened. What, what happened here? Could we have prevented it, for example? Uh, why, does it, why do they pick Bowling Green? Why didn't they pick somewhere else? Maybe questions, please. Okay, do we have a cure? Is there an antidote for this, for example? Or is this going to spread like an epidemic soon? And maybe just one more question. Are you sure? Okay. Okay, are you sure? How many have heard that question? Are you sure? Can you give us a guarantee? Um, Later, if you'd like, we could talk about various templates in response to questions. But notice, for example, what can happen if you respond to questions such as, are you sure with, quest with answers such as, or can you guarantee? No, I can't guarantee the safety of Bowling Green. You might see on the evening news a quote from a public health official. Public health official says, no guarantee for safety of Bowling Green. You might read ex-public health official from Bowling Green. Uh, what is it we're looking for in terms of, of message development? And here, I just I'm just giving a, a couple of examples uh, of what the research literature has to offer. It has to offer, number one, a great deal of research on people's attention spans. And we have to be attentive to people's attention spans because after they reach their limit, they will achieve a level of cognitive low overload that prevents the processing of information, hearing, understanding, and remembering. The rule here is the 2793, which means that for each and every question we've anticipated will come up, that we prepare a message that is brief. Ideally, no more than three messages. Ideally, less than nine seconds. Ideally, less than 27 words. We want to make sure that we organize the information in such a way that it becomes easy for the person to process. For example, the triple T model. How many have heard of the model? It was actually first identified in ancient Greece. Tell people what you're going to tell them. Tell them more. Tell them again. How many have heard that somewhere along the line? It's a very good way by which to organize information, give a brief summary of what you're going to talk about, go into more detail, go into again. But here's one that, that might be a little more less obvious. If you have several messages that you want to share as part of your 2793, how do you organize those messages? How would you organize? For example, where should the most important message appear? It should always appear first. 
What about your second most important message? If you have three messages to share in response to a question such as, are you sure? How does it spread? Will the governor call out the National Guard? And you've developed your three messages that you will briefly state and then perhaps go into more elaboration on it and then return at the end. Where would you put your second most important message? Last. And the one that you consider to be expendable should go where? In between. I'll give you a personal, one of the things I'm going to hope at the end of this presentation is that you not only take this back into your professional practice, but take it back into your personal practice, which means at home. I'll give you an example where this came up recently with my own home life. Um, we were having a party and we ran out of several things that we needed for, uh, my wife was cooking and she needed something for a recipe, so she asked me to go out shopping. Um, she made a list of things that we needed. I did, I got the shopping list brought the stuff back. She opened up the bag, was pleased, but then noticed that the most important thing that she needed for the recipe was missing. Um, I apologized and said I'd go right out again. But then I looked at the list that she had given me of things to buy at the grocery store. And the item that she said was most important of the eight items on the list was listed as number six. I proceeded to say, I'll go out to the grocery store, but did you happen to notice that you put it at number six? He sh and I said, she should have put it where? If it was the most important item on the list, she should have gone where? Number one or number last. She wasn't very pleased with this. She was very anxious at the time. Being lectured on what's called primacy recency. But nonetheless, I'll argue that the principles of communication don't have to be reserved for a crisis. You don't have to wait, for example, to go in front of the media, in front of cameras in a disaster to start using the skills of effective communication. You can start making it part of your daily life. Um, these are my three messages. If, in fact, the, the ancient Greeks were right that the best way to present is to tell people what you can tell them, tell them more, tell them again. Um, I can summarize where I am right now with three messages. Number one, there's a very large body of scientific research that's available for those in the public health community, both at the national, state, county, and local level, to be better communicators in a high-stress, high-concern situation a very large body of knowledge. I mentioned as many as 8,000 articles, 4,000 books. Available for, it's like a candy store, of information that will help us to be more effective in our communications, both in preparedness and implementation. The second is that there are major differences between the ways we communicate in low stress situations compared to high stress. An example would be the town meeting. The town meeting or that format is a very effective device in low stress environments such as a classroom. The fact, for example, that I'm up here in the front and that you're in classroom style seating, sh I should be indifferent to it in a classroom setting because it's low stress. But there is a high stress, then I have to consider the 15% rule. That I'm not likely to engage in a very constructive dialogue with my audience if in fact I put them together as a group which means small is beautiful. And the third is that the notion of preparedness. As with everything else in public health, we have an obligation to be prepared. But prepared in, for communication, I'm trying to turn up the, the heat on this, the gas. What, what we mean by preparedness. That preparedness means that we're, we are knowledgeable of all the rules and principles of communication and then implement them in our public health practice. Well, what are these rules, and uh, I've given you a, 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 a sampling of them. It's almost like a preview, a trailer to a movie. If you wanted to pursue these rules in much greater depth, then I would argue there's several places to go. There are four major literatures that make up the risk communication literature. They have names. The names are less important than the concepts they communicate. The names are mental noise, number two, trust, distrust, number three, negative dominance, and number th four, threat perception. Each of them tells us something about the human mind under conditions of stress. Each of them tells us something about what we're expected, what our competencies are, what competencies are necessary by which to meet the challenge posed by each of these four major categories. What do they mean? Uh, mental noise means that when people are under stress, they have great difficulty hearing, understanding, and remembering information. Hearing, understanding, and remembering information. That the stressed event itself, the emotion, the competing ideas, interfere with the ability to process information. 
In fact, that leads to what's called the 80% rule, which is that in high stress situations, people typically lose as much as 80% of the information being shared to them. With this in mind, each team, again, whoever is your neighbor, work out for me the solutions to this problem. If, in fact, this is true, that you can expect that in a high stress, high concern situation, such as a bioterrorist event, that people will typically lose as much as 80% of the information shared through any means, be it an op information forum, fact sheet, press conference, uh, response to a toll-free number, phone call, that they typically will lose 80% of information. I'd like you to make, and this is a speed exercise, you have 30 seconds, as many solutions as you can possibly think of to that particular problem. What would be the solutions to this problem, the 80% rule? What would they be? Just take a second with yourself, with your colleagues. Thirty seconds. Uh, if you have ever taken a course in risk and crisis communication, there would be a very simple assignment I gave you because you would have probably about fifty to sixty different solutions immediately at the tip of your tongue as a solution to this single problem itself. Why? Because it's been the subject of sustained research for nearly three decades. How do we overcome the mental noise that accompanies virtually all high stress situations? Yeah. Okay, keep it brief and repeat what you have to say. Keep it brief and repeat what you, and what does it mean to be brief though? Some, uh, 27 words, good. Now I can give you the $5 I promised to uh, on the basis. What else would we do? Make it personal, right. Find ways to be able to, as opposed to at a general level. And this is again one of the problems of the, it's very difficult to make a message personal, for example, when you're dealing with a large group. Certainly when you're dealing with individuals on a one-on-one -on -one basis, you can, you can then respond to the individual's needs, their level of stress, their level of knowledge, their need for information to resolve that stress. The more personal you can make it, in other words, the smaller the audience, the more you can customize and focus it, the more effective the communication, which argues against, once again, against large congregations of individuals. Maybe just one more. Anything else that would solve this problem? Please. Okay, the person in charge has to show competence, competence as a way by which to deal. I'm not going to follow you as a leader unless I see that you're, you're carrying the characteristics of competence and expertise. Uh, I should mention in that regard that a person will judge your competence and expertise by not only the words and actions, but also what you look like when you speak. For example, the, this is another one of these rules that has a percentage associated. It's called the 75% rule. In high stress situations, as much as 75% of messages about issues such as competence come from your nonverbal communication as opposed to your verbal communication. It's called the 75% rule. That in high stress situations, we rely more on our nonverbal and our visual cues than we do on our oral cues in terms of what we hear. In other words, we're more likely to be what we look like, what we say when we say something, than what we say itself. And that typically averages out to be about 75%. Once again, there's a cultural diversity issue here, but in Western European culture, the three main ways by which you communicate competence as a public health official is how you carry yourself in terms of your eyes, your posture, and your hands. Uh, this is not true in other cultures necessarily. For example, in some cultures of the world, the eyes play a very small part of the communication. In fact, you don't look a person in the eye. You don't, for example, lean slightly forward. You don't keep your hands open and your posture one of openness. But nonetheless, this is the way we judge, and therefore we have to make sure that we're communicating effectively and adapt to those type of considerations. The second major uh, theory that underlies the, fear, the, the topic of crisis communication, risk communication, communicating fire is called trust-distrust theory. And it has a very unfortunate uh, result, and that is that when people are under stress, they become highly distrustful distrustful of all those in authority, including the messengers. Those who deliver bad news are distrusted as much as those who are the source of the bad news itself. The good news is, is that we actually know a great deal about trust. Nearly three decades of research with tentacles extending back to ancient Greece tell us that trust is made up of at least four dimensions. One of the ones that you just mentioned, the issues of competence, expertise, and knowledge. But also inclusive in that is the notion of listening, 
caring, empathy, compassion, honesty, openness, transparency, as well as dedication, commitment, hard work. Uh, in fact, we actually know that, unfortunately, what makes this even more difficult is that rather than focusing on the positive, negative dominance theory tells us that in high stress situations, people tend to focus on the negative. If we're attempting to communicate positive messages about listening, caring, empathy, honesty, competence, that people will be focusing on the negative. I'll pursue that one step further. One of the most devastating and most difficult hurdles to overcome in any high stress situation comes from the formula that one N equals three P. One negative is equal to three positives. Which means, here's a practical implication. If you have bad news to share, if you have bad news to share, for example, we've discovered a case of XYZ disease in our community. Obviously, you have an obligation to share that message, but also there's an implication, which is that if you share bad news, which is an N, you're obligated in order to restore a psychological equilibrium to do what? To share at least three positives, or at least three non-negatives, constructive next steps that people can take in their public health response to give them a sense of control, a sense of control. Um, the last and final uh, theory is called risk perception, sometimes outrage theory. And you'll often see a, uh, associated with that something called the 5% rule, which is that often less than 5% of the correlation between actual and perceived risk can be explained by the facts themselves. That what people perceive to be risky and what experts perceive to be risky are often at odds with one another. And that there are many other factors that interfere with the ability to process information in an accurate way. These are sometimes referred to as outrage factors, risk perception factors. And I've listed here just three. The first is trustworthiness. That it can change the perception of risk as much as a thousandfold. Second, the notion of choice and control, which links us right back to that notion of a sense of control can affect also the ability of a person to process in information as much as a thousandfold. Will change and magnify a perceived risk into higher or lower. And third is the perception of benefits and fairness. For example, the social justice issue, if people feel they're not being treated fairly. And this is where, again, we have to come back and, and look at history. For example, one of the most serious threats to public health that took place during the anthrax experience was by the perceived, not necessarily reality, but perception equals reality, the perceived in unequal handling of individuals exposed to anthrax, such as Senate office building workers and postal workers. There was perception created that somehow or other we treat different parts of our society unequally. Some are more equal than others in terms of testing of the buildings, evacuation, and response. This can change the perception as much as a thousandfold. Just to illustrate how these work, if we talk mental noise theory, I'll just share with you some of the, uh, the key, uh, key findings. Again, I, I have a short period of time, and I, I really just wanted to give you a sampling of a, of a much, much larger literature that helps to guide us in high-stress situations. If we go back to mental noise literature, the fact that people have difficulty hearing, understanding, remembering, what are the sum of things that we know that will help us to overcome that barrier? Probably the most important. And the fact that I have this first implies what? It's the most important. It's the most important. Um, it says that people are not willing, generally, to listen to you unless they feel that you know them and are willing to listen to them. The reciprocity principle. Extending that next, again, we had a brief discussion, but here's some of the points that you just made a second ago. Brevity. Which means that for each and every anticipated question that we have prepared at 2793, that we make sure we inf share that as part of something called the sixth grade rule. When you share that to the public, that all information organized as a 2793 has to be clearly understood by a sixth grader. This is the standard used, for example, for USA Today. How old is a sixth grader? 11 or 12 years old. A challenge for those in public health because we have to make sure that all our information, at least in the first pass, is translated to be easily accessible to those who would receive the information. And the third is to make sure that we repeat our messages, repeat our messages so that if in fact it's important to say, it's an important enough to say more than once. That would lead us up to one of the most important tools that's used currently in the public health system 
For example, CDC and others have constructed what are called message maps. Message maps by which to document the messages in response to anticipated questions in a format that becomes easily accessible to others. It's called a message map. It means you document at the very top who is the stakeholder, what are their concerns, and then in these blocks of threes, beginning with your 2793, that you continue to evolve the message. Uh, some other, for example, solutions to the problem, though, is what happens when you don't know the answer? This is wonderful if you can anticipate the question and you don't know the answer. And I put this in because it's one of the many templates that make up the risk and crisis communication literature. It's called the IDK or the I don't know template. It's one model, one option available to you to respond to questions when you don't have a message map, when you don't have a 2793 to offer as a subject matter expert. We'll often find ourselves in that situation. There are five steps to the model. First, acknowledge, repeat the question. Number two, indicate that you don't know wish you could answer it. Number three, indicate the reasons or reasons why you can't answer it. Number four, indicate the follow-up with the deadline. And number five, to what you can say of a factual nature. Uh, because of time, I can't go into much detail, but just quickly on this one. If you take, let's say, the first step in this process uh, in your team, with your team member, I'd like you quickly, why would you want to repeat a question back to someone? They obviously know what their question is. So why would you want to waste their time and your time by repeating a question that you already have just heard. Each team, team member, discuss it among you. There should be three reasons that come from this at a minimum. Three, three is a critical number for all our communications. Three reasons, why? Why would you want to repeat back the question as the first stage of the model? Any response? Uh, why? There's got to be a reason here, otherwise there's no logic. In fact, there should be no science if there's no logic. Why would you want to repeat a question back to someone who just asked you a question? Please. Make sure you've heard the question right, just make sure you've heard the question correctly. How often does it happen in life when we, don't miss, when we mishear what others say to us? If you played telephone as a kid, you know what I'm referring to. We mishear others. In addition to clarifying, making sure we're on the same script, what else would we want to do? Yeah, rec recognition of worth, for example, it indicates at a minimum we're a good listener. And I'll argue, number three, it buys you some time. It buys you some time, which in a high-stress situation is a very scarce resource that you need. Um, if we follow this further, for example, there are other rules. And again, because of time, I'll just briefly mention what they would be. Everything from the use of visuals. For example, the work of Tufti at Yale University indicates that you can get as much as 50% greater attention retention as well as recall of a message when you have a good visual to enhance the message. That your attention, for example, to nonverbals becomes critical because as much as 75% of the message is carried by the nonverbals. And finally, the importance of face-to-face. -face. I just want to finish with one last thing. It comes from the trust literature. I said before that trust is driven by many characteristics, listening, honesty, competence, dedication. This is a pie chart that describes the four major dimensions, but in terms of their weight. The reason I want to share this is because I want to finish up with uh, what I believe is a, a historical event that occurred on 9-11 from a communication perspective. A response that Mayor Giuliani offered up in response to the first question he received at the press conference. The question was, it's one of the anticipated questions in any crisis situation, how many people were harmed, how many were killed? Part of our preparedness in public health, part of our respect for others, is to prepare in advance that for which we can anticipate. The response you gave back was a perfect Churchill, Churchill model communication, based on the premise that all great communication in a high stress situation should communicate compassion, conviction, and optimism. We want to show that we care before we care what we know. The statement was, again, the question was, how many people do you think die, have died? The answer was, more than any of us can bear. And from this great disaster, we've become stronger. Stronger emotionally, economically, and politically. The question is, uh, has, have these principles been implemented in, by those who are in the Iraq situation? Let me just illustrate is that, uh, I'll, I'll be very blunt in my, my response to this, is that uh, if I had to compare two wars, for example, the communications that took place during the Gulf War compared to the communications there, I believe that that 
the Gulf War in many ways stands as, as a standard by which to judge current performance. And that we fall, fall far short in terms of our, our skill in communication. I give an example. General Norman Schwarzkopf was extraordinary. Extraordinary in a wide variety of ways, including what I just mentioned, preparedness. We know, for example, from the case study that he spent incredible amount of time, just like Churchill did. We know that Churchill, for example, would always prepare every speeches. He would give 30 practice sessions of every speech before he gave it. Churchill had, for example, often quoted a, a remark by both Abraham Lincoln as well as by Mark Twain. Abraham Lincoln's quote was, if I had all day to cut down an, a, a big tree, I'd spend most of the time sharpening the axe. And the quote from Mark Twain was, it takes me on average two weeks to prepare an impromptu speech. Churchill was never impromptu. He looked impromptu. But in fact, you were watching the results of someone who had prepared himself for the communication. Same thing with Schwarzkopf. And I give an example of, of Schwarzkopf, uh, and, and where I think he set a new standard for those in the military. Something that I've, I've, I've noticed I'm, I'm missing. I don't see very much compassion. That last slide I showed was compassion, conviction, optimism. Um, I see a lot of conviction, but I don't see much compassion. Example, Schwarzkopf received this question from Barbara Walters. The question was, uh, General, Yes or no, are you happy that so few died during the Gulf, Storm, Gulf War? Yes or no? Nasty question. Um, I didn't discuss today how to deal with the media. They're a very special audience that requires very specialized training. Because often they'll ask questions that, that, that can throw you for a loop. They may be a trap. They may be naivete. But nonetheless, they have to be answered. In this case, it was a yes, no. The problem with the yes, no relating to compassion, if he says, yes, I'm happy that so few died in the Gulf War, what's wrong with that? indicates lack of compassion. What if he says, uh, no, I wish there were more? Shows lack of compassion. Uh, that question had been asked 25 years earlier by Barbara Walters in an interview with Secretary McNamara right after the Vietnam War. McNamara's response to the same question by the same reporter, perfect deja vu, 20 years apart was, McNamara's response was, the question was, yes or no, are you happy that only 58,000 soldiers died during the Vietnam War compared to several hundred thousand in World War II? His answer was, I'm very satisfied with the body count ratios we achieved. What does that lack? Compassion. Schwartz, Schwarzkopf, 25 years later. First, let me ask you this question. One of my key points from today was anticipating questions before they're raised as part of your communication crisis preparedness. How many believe that, that, that Barbara Walters' question was in Schwarzkopf's briefing books? I've seen it, so I, I know the briefing books. How many believe it was in his briefing books? Okay. Why would it be in his briefing? Why would you assume it's in his briefing books? Turns out, I, I didn't share it today, but the major ways by which you find out what people want to know, what questions they'll raise, what concerns. First is by asking themselves. This is why you have an advantage in local boards of health, because you are at the local level. You know what people's concerns are. You can listen to them one-on-one. -on -one. You can also use history as a guide. What does history tell us? In this case, the history of Barbara Walters' interviews. They had a three-inch binder on Barbara Walters. Three inches of all the questions she ever asked in every interview. It's great when you ever get sta a large staff to work on things, but you can also do this on your own, uh, scale it back. You can also ask subject matter experts. You can do empathetic role playing. What would I ask if I was Barbara Walters? Those various techniques, asking the actual person, using history as a guide, empathetic role playing, asking subject matter experts will produce the 95% that I mentioned before, the 95% rule. Does anybody remember what that was? The 95% rule is what? 95% of the questions for any public health controversy can be predicted in advance. Can't be predicted. In which case you can predict it, you can do what? Start developing your answers. This is Schwarzkopf's response to that question. He said, Ms. Walters, I have three things to say. Is that nice? <laughs> Great beginning. Okay, already he's warmed himself up to my heart. Anybody who's got three messages goes right back to Aristotle. Three messages with three supporting facts. He said, the three things are first, even one is too many. That message is a message of what? Compassion. And he said, that's so important, I'll say it again. Even one is too many. What's he doing now? Repeating his message, reinforcing it. And his third message is that many times I've cried to sleep at night thinking about the boys and their families, and a tear will have we Phenomenal. Um, and by the way, the briefing book doesn't say shed tear now. It's, um, the, the, you can push the limit of preparedness where you take all spontaneity out. Uh, I have a problem with my wife in this regard. I prepare notes for every argument we ever had. Uh, I take time, prepare my notes, and actually I prepare my 2793s based on 
the allegations or concerns she has about my behavior. She doesn't like it, but nonetheless, it's possible to do that type of preparedness. Yeah. That raises the fact of the matter in terms of training people. What do we have to do to make bright, competent folks in public health who have all the other skills understand just how important these skills are and make it a part of their training? Certainly no training I ever had. And my failures are a result of not knowing how to communicate or being willing to take the time to do as well. Yeah. There's a there's a number of things that I, I could say, and, and perhaps and, and I could, I'd like to encourage this to be a discussion, because uh, I, I, the, the fact that I showed that quote from Ed Baker to begin with, when he said that the major challenge and maybe the major failure of public health in response to anthrax was communication. And as we move into the 21st century, communication may well become the central science of public health. is an important antidote to what you just said, because he's basically saying that that the new public health that we're talking about in the 20th century, 21st century requires more of people than just simply the ability to do their job well. But they have to be able to communicate as well as they perform. And it's a, like a paradigm shift. It's a paradigm shift. And it begins with the leadership. With the leadership both promoting the importance of communication but also being models of communication themselves. For example, if they're poor communicators, they say this is what you're supposed to do and you should go out to train yourself, et cetera, but they, for example, don't express compassion, conviction, optimism. If they don't offer up 2793s, if they don't use the I don't know template, then very quickly people say this is just these words and not really a commitment to a new competency in public health. This is also listed in all the competencies. There's a lot of work going on in the United States right now in terms of competencies. And key in those competencies as a paradigm shift in public health is the notion of communication, which then in turn leads to what are these competencies? How do we train people? Should they be in schools of public health, for example? Should we train people in the field or should we train people as part of their public health educations? Please. What about the role of humor? Humor. Uh, humor is one of the trickier uh, communication tools. And, and this is one of the things you could certainly train a person to be sensitive to. Uh, I've written actually several articles about humor because it's, it, it is a tool that is often used in crisis situations. It's used for four reasons. In fact, the same reasons that Toastmasters recommends it. Number one, it relieves tension, relaxes people. Humor bonds you with someone, establishes rapport. It attracts attention and becomes an indirect way to share information. The downside of humor, and unfortunately this is where the two-edged sword comes into play. On the one hand, it can help break through a person in order to get their attention, to get a message across. But there's a much more serious danger involved. And why the recommendation in the risk and crisis communication is do not use humor when dealing with individuals other than your colleagues. With your collegial humor, we were talking about this, for example, during a break. Collegial humor is an extremely important way by which to establish rapport with others. Collegial humor is the type you see in MASH in a surgery room. But when talking particularly to victims, individuals who have experienced loss, it strips you almost entirely of the perception of caring. If you, if you saw that almost subliminal slide that I shared, the one that had the pie chart, you know that if in fact you strip away a person's perception of caring because it looks like you're trivializing the issue and not taking it seriously, how much credibility do you lose? Do you remember from that slide? As much as 50%. You could never recover from that. Once you've made a serious mistake, um, I ran into this in my first study. 25 years ago. It was called the 50 Most Frequently Asked Questions by Terminally Ill Patients. A physician got a question from a, a patient. <coughs> the question was, Doc, I just ordered a really expensive hi-fi system and record player. Does this mean I have to cancel the order? It wasn't how long, how sure, how much pain and suffering. It was a question about his great love in live music. And the physician said back, I wouldn't cancel the record player order, but I wouldn't buy any long playing records. Um, sometimes we misplace our humor. It, it has a role to play, certainly in Toastmasters. If you ever go to a wedding and start off without a joke, somebody else should be the Toastmaster. But in high stress, high concern situations, the recommendation is to leave humor behind and do not include it in your repertoire. Please. If Marshall McLuhan is right and reading this message, I had two things I want to ask you. First of all, why did you give your speech without a coat on? Are you trying to convey something by your shirt? Secondly, uh, how were you able to control your temper when that problem with that microphone, certainly aggravating you, and you controlled it very well. And I thought you did remarkably well. And uh, so first of all, you did this intentionally, you did not have a coat on. Okay. And, uh, You're absolutely right. Um, my, 
my wife, this is actually pointing out to something my wife's disturbed about. She knows that there's nothing accidental in my communications. Uh, what might look impromptu is actually thought out in terms of what. And even such things as I consciously did not wear a jacket. And if you remembered how I began my presentation, you'll see the linkage. On the one hand, I want to be respectful to Ned Baker and others by wearing a tie, a formal tie. This is a sign of respect, formality. But I also took myself down one level from the jacket, my suit, to my shirt and tie. For what reason? What, what was my first thing that I was asking you to do with me? Be comfortable, be relaxed, be informal, to engage in dialogue with me. I really meant it. I really wanted, you know, I, I, I don't like teaching as a lecturer. I like discussion. I like dialogue. I like sharing experiences. I like sharing what the research says, but see if it, it sort of tracks with what experience and knowledge in the field says. And I find if I look more relaxed, for example, more informal, more casual than a formal suit would look like, that it might encourage some of those who might be more reluctant to speak up, to, to speak up, going back to that 15% rule. In terms of calmness, I'll, I'll argue that uh, calmness is a function of, of experience. It's, it's, uh, I, I've been teaching now 28 years. I feel very comfortable. Uh, obviously, it's annoying if the microphone doesn't work and you're getting squeaks and things. And, and, I, and I, I really found bound there because I, I couldn't go outside of the box. I was told very specifically by the manager, do not go outside of that box <laughs> because the, the light, you'll go into the dark and they won't see you and then a the camera will go crazy and things like that. So here I am in the box being told that the microphone above me is, is the one that's causing the problem. But I'm also told not to move outside of underneath the, uh, the speaker on top. Ooh. <laughs> um, um, but I, if I feel comfortable with, and again, it goes back to dealing with stress. One of the types of trainings, and this goes back to your question, I consider a public health training for purposes of communication in a crisis as incomplete until I put people under extreme stress. Uh, simulations, I argue, that are relaxed, comfortable, tabletops are not really a simulation of real life. For those who went through anthrax, the, the chaos that occurs in 9-11, certainly, for example, that you know that training a person to deal with stress without putting them through stress is an incomplete training. Uh, and it's not a pleasant thing to, to experience. Well, who else, who, you know, you have to be almost, you know, sort of masochistic to want to be put under pressure. But it makes a big difference. Uh, for example, at the lunch today, today I, I, I just gave an example. When I train individuals to deal with the media, I don't give them a training of a, of a nice small town reporter who basically takes everything you say and then prints it word for word. That's great. In fact, that's one advantage that many small towns have is that the reporter is a cub reporter. You know, they're, they, uh, they'll take whatever you say and just take it at, 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 at face value and print it, sometimes take your press release and put their name on it. But just try to deal with a 60-minute reporter, and you'll find that there's a very different world out there. Starting off, for example, with ways to, let's say, how many have heard the, the principle? I mean, I could share it. I could put it on a board a thousand times. Stay on the record. You're never off the record. And yet, it's almost like there's a game here. There's a thousand ways to convince you you're off the record when, in fact, you're on the record. And until you put a person through that stress, until they say, gee, I really have to be more attentive, it would be equivalent for example, saying, but I'd walk in, can you help me on this? Let's do a little stress exercise. Can I put you under stress? Uh, let's say you're, uh, I don't know if you even work in public health, by the way, Mom Vincent, let me just, um, let's say I'm a reporter, I walk in, and do you mind if I just, let's say we agreed, there's a whole bunch of questions you're supposed to ask a reporter before they ask you something, so you, you know how stressful it's going to be. Um, for example, what stories have they call it covered before, who are they going to talk to before or after. You can get a pretty good sense of whether or not this is a cup reporter who's going to take everything you say versus an investigative reporter who really, after blood, a Pulitzer surprise. So I might walk in and say, hi, I'm, I'm Vincent. I just want to ask you a couple of questions about smallpox bioterrorism. Is that okay with you? Good. Um, you know, it's going to be a couple of minutes before we set up the, um, the cameras here and things like that. and Maybe we just chat for a little bit. Uh, uh, I, I had some trouble getting here. I, I never expected that you would ever have traffic jams here in Bowling Green, but I ran into some traffic. Do you ever run into traffic jams like that? Really? It, it's really frustrating when you can't get sort of where you want to go, isn't it? Right. And sometimes you don't even know where you're going, right? <laughs> yeah, sure, right. That's, where you, that's what's public health. They don't know where they're going, do they? Because there's a big gridlock going on right now in public health relating to smallpox response, right? <laughs> okay, Mark Twain had a statement also relating to this. Uh, by the way, I apologize for, for being aggressive with you. 
Mark Twain said, never do battle with somebody who buys their ink in barrels. You actually did barrel, battle with me now. You said, I'm putting my words in your mouth. And I was. I definitely was. No, but notice, for example, we haven't stopped the interview yet, by the way. <laughs> okay. Uh, I can start getting you look defensive. Okay. Uh, and defensiveness can become the story. As long as I'm in the room. I purposely did that, by the way. I wanted to make you think the interview had stopped when it never stopped. Okay? Just because I turn away and talk to something else, take a phone call, doesn't mean the interview stopped. As long as I'm present, you're being interviewed. And everything you say is on the record, including, for example, your nonverbal communication. For example, if you look defensive, I can make that the story. In fact, I can even take all the words out. I questioned the public health official today, and she was extremely defensive, claiming I was putting words in her mouth. Misquoted, <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, that's what I mean by stress. Uh, what I mean by stress is that, for example, uh, one of the things that I, when I might meet a training, I recommend that, that you treat a reporter as if she's your, your grandmother, your frail old grandmother, you know, who's having sort of trouble hearing and things like that. Just to have a, a visual image of someone who, that you have to be a queen of England, that you have to be super nice to, and they, they can do no wrong. It's difficult to adopt that attitude because reporters can do lots of wrong. They can be abusive. Uh, derogatory, uh, ask you stupid questions. Well, they're getting worse because the media, for example, this is interesting. Um, the, the media at one time were, were not uh, a major money maker for most, uh, they were lost leaders. Um, starting in 1991, something happened though. Uh, the coverage of the Gulf War was actually very consequential. It convinced a lot of media outlets that you could make a lot of money from the media. Um, that it becomes, the news becomes entertainment. And the radical change has taken place that now news is almost more entertainment than it is news, which leads, for example, to celebrity reporters, uh, lawsuits, everything else under the world. And it really is a new world in which we, which we live today, and one that I would argue requires a different level of preparedness in public health, because how many of those in public health, for example, ever went through intensive media training? In, in public health school as a way by which to deal with an investigative reporter who's trying every trick in the trade to get you to get off record and say something that you'll be sorry for later. I mean, it's, it's an attitude towards others that is just not part of our personalities. I'm not certainly, I don't like to think that, it, that someone is, is going to try to trip me up. And yet, for example, we know with the modern media that often is the objective to try to trip a person up. Traps and pitfalls, asking questions such as the guarantee question. Can you guarantee? Just to get you to say, I can't guarantee. Asking you for a worst case. What's the worst case? For example, if we had gridlock here in Bowling Green because of a smallpox terrorist attack, the impossibility, for example, of roping off a large university like this. Is it possible that all these kids, for example, will take the smallpox home to their communities when they run home to their parents and we could spread smallpox to the whole rest of the country and the world? That's possible, isn't it? Oh, I have to ask Ned Baker. <laughs> Actually, you could have used the I don't know model, <laughs> IDK. You know, that's a good question. For example, what would happen if we had a smallpox attack here? Uh, I'm really not the expert. Ned Baker is the expert. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll put you in touch with Ned. In the meantime, what I can tell you is how well we're prepared here in Bowling Green. That would be one of the ways you bunch it. But Ned, I'm not going to ask you to respond to that question. But nonetheless, <laughs> but nonetheless it's, 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 it's a trap. It's a trap, for example, because I'm trying to get a worst case scenario created that creates a huge, negative, nightmarish, worst case image. There's a variety of models by which to respond to a worst case. Everything from, you've asked me a what if, let's talk about what is. Let's talk about our preparedness. It means, for example, another model is to use what's called the PC model. You talk about how you prevent the worst case from happening through preparedness, how you contain it, what your emergency response efforts are. There's actually quite a few models you can use to respond to that question, but the one that you don't want to do is to raise the specter of a huge, disastrous, beyond the pale of probability scenario. Please. Uh, my I said okay. Is there, any there is recovery, but unfortunately, it just like in a, in a marriage, if you if there's a major transgression, you'll never fully recover your credibility back again. And unfortunately, in order to recover credibility once it's lost, requires you to engage in additional rules of the road. For example, credible third parties. Right now, public health has the advantage of being perceived. We lost some credibility after anthrax because of a variety of things such as inconsistent messages, perceived unfairness in 
in how we dealt with indiv individuals. Lack of competence. You know, we didn't know answers to questions they, they, the public thought we should know answers, such as whether or not anthrax scores can escape from a sealed envelope. And I could go through a long litany of things that lost trust in public health. How do you restore public health when it's lost? Well, there's a variety of things. For example, one is partnering. Partnering, the whole process of partnering means bringing in credible third parties. That's why local public health has such a role to play. You are part of the community when you are in local public health. You mirror other people. When they see you, they see a reflection of themselves because you are part of the community. You're not from CDC in Atlanta, Georgia. You're not a bureaucrat from Washington, D.C. You're partnering now with the local health department. This is particularly important if, if in fact, an emergency is here, right? Because uh, most people don't realize that a public health emergency involves police powers, sometimes even going beyond police powers. And the way to restore credibility is to make sure that you link yourself with X number of credible third parties that will validate your messages and your actions. X. I didn't give a number because I think you know the number. How many credible third parties or partners do you need in order to establish credibility once it's been lost? There's now you need some people standing shoulder to shoulder with you. So when you communicate, you can't communicate on your own anymore. Now you need somebody looking over your shoulder. But how many people do you need looking over your shoulder? Actually, it's four. That's, that's excellent. OK. Um, I, I expected to trick you on this one. Uh, it turns out you would think it would be three. But there's a negative out there, a negative that you can't be trusted. That you yourself have lost trust. And if you offer up three, you would simply do what? you would have created an equilibrium. Four, because what's the universal, I, I shared with you three universal values. Desire to avoid embarrassment, to be in control, and number three, what? To win and not lose. Four gives you a win. You have four credible sources standing next to you. In fact, this is what Giuliani did when he went to Saturday Night Live. I still remember it very vividly. Uh, three weeks after 9-11, he stood on the stage of Saturday Night Live. Very dangerous to appear on a comedy program so soon after a major disaster. Nonetheless, he was there, but he had standing next to him representatives of more than four groups in order to support his position to appear on Saturday Night Live, to communicate messages such as thanking those who were g had given their lives to protect others, such as that the city is open for business and that we welcome others. But he wouldn't do it himself, even with his credibility. He didn't do it himself. Instead, he realized that to establish trust means sometimes you have to align yourself with trust, with partners. And the partners on the stage included the police, the fire, the emergency response, public health. It included family vic victims, families. It included other politicians, even his most severe opponents. And they all were standing shoulder to shoulder on a stage together, um, welcoming people to Saturday Night Live, the premier season. Uh, there was no criticism the next day either, because if you critique someone who's perceived as credible with many credible sources, you put yourself in grave danger. Um, Schwarzkopf did that in response to the next question Barbara Walters asked him was, do real men cry? Do real generals cry? Um, he responded to what I thought was a fabulous answer. He said, um, sure they cried. Well, Grant cried. Sherman cried. Lee cried. Lincoln cried at Gettysburg. In fact, any man who doesn't cry scares me a little bit. 27 words, three messages, but he had four credible sources to back him up. Even he saw his credibility on the line against Barbara Walters, and he had four to one as a way by which to reestablish equilibrium. <laughs> Any other comments, questions, anything? Yeah, please. If, if communication is a science and a trainable skill, then in some ways you would want people specifically trained in that to serve as your communicator <coughs> in moments of great need. But how do you keep them credible? Because their skills are also the skills of an interrogator, propagandist. What steps do you take to both get the specialists in the science you need in communication in the future, but retain that credibility by linking them firmly to a beneficial quote? Okay. Okay, good. In fact, you just raised an issue that had its first echo two thousand years ago in ancient Greece. When Aristotle, for example, taught rhetoric, principles of classical communication, such rules of three, he also said that the ultimate skill is the skill of ethics. That what must temper technique and skill has to be ethics. It's why, for example, when I teach my 14-week course, the first book I ask my students to read 
and be examined by me before they're allowed to take the course. In other words, I will not share technique because, in fact, I can, can probably convince, t teach someone to be convincing about anything. And that worries me because it means it leads to possible abuse, misrepresentation. The book I have my students read is a book that I'll, I'll just leave you with because I sense that there's someone behind me. <laughs> um, it's a book by Cecilia Bach, B-O-K, B-O-K. Uh, it's, it's a rather lengthy book. It's written by uh, an individual that most individuals consider to be the leading ethicist in our country today. Her name is Bach, Cecilia Bach, and the book is called Lying, L-Y-I-N-G. Very simple title. It's a book on ethics. I, I've never seen a book that really challenges us more in terms of, of, of a fundamental, something in particularly in today's world we have to be worried about even more so after Enron and WorldCom and ever, is the perception that the ends justify the means um, seeing oneself in a very small world as opposed to, that's right, right. Um, and I'd recommend that, and I think that's a good way, for example, to finish is, is on ethics. That ethics must temper technique. Thank you. The fourth annual Ned E. Baker Lecture in Public Health is sponsored in part by the National Association of Local Boards of Health, the Wood County Hospital Foundation, the Cove Charitable Trust of Boston, the Northwest Ohio Consortium for Public Health, the Western Reserve Geriatric Education Center, and the College of Health and Human Services of Bowling Green State University.